وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِنْ مَنْ مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ وَسَعَى فِي خَرَابِهَا أُولَئِكَ مَا كَانَ لَهُمْ أَنْ يَدْخُلُوهَا إِلَّا خَائِفِينَ لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم Khair for that. Um, I'll just take a question from the chat, inshallah. Uh, so the question was regarding what you were saying before. Um, Pakistan was founded very much on this idea of Islam. It actually, you know, the, the Pakistan movement kind of grew out of the Khilafat movement in India. How uh, the question is asking, uh, I'll just get that question up so I can quote it for you. Um, what, why did Pakistan deviate from that plan? What went wrong? So what, why did they deviate away from their origin? Um, I think you have to understand that, that you really, you know, this movement, uh, this sentiment, you know, because, you know, when you have a political movement in any country, there's, there's, there's emotion, there's sentiment, there's ideas behind uh, any political movement. And in, Pakistan, in Pakistan's case, what's actually happened is that, um, you know, the, the big feudal landlords who were part of the, the Muslim uh, feudal landlords, many of whom which were given land by the British for their services to the British Raj, they played an instrumental role as well in helping to create Pakistan. And unfortunately, the creation of Pakistan also served British interests at the time as well, because when it acted, you know, rather than having a united India, having another country there only enabled the British to be able to, be able to you know, meddle in the political affairs of the Indian subcontinent. It acted as a buffer uh, against Russia as well, coming down from Afghanistan. So there's various interests there at play. But these landlords and these big powerful people who were, uh, you know, Muslims uh, who were in India and who became part of the Indian Muslim League, you know, once Pakistan was formed, it was never the case that these people were going to leave things as they were. You know, they've used democracy. You know, um, democracy has really been used by uh, the elites in Pakistan, uh, you know, to really capture the ruling uh, in Pakistan. And since partition, since 1947, these people have remained at the helm. These families. These few thousand families, they have not given up power. Yes, power has been, you know, exchanged amongst them. It's circulated amongst them, almost like musical chairs. It's gone from one party to another. But effectively, you see the same ruling elite ruling in Pakistan. And we see the effects of this even today. Uh, those of you following the affairs in Pakistan closely will have seen the, the, uh, the Senate ele elections fiasco, where the ruling party, the PTI, uh, led by Imran Khan, you know, they spectacularly failed to gain uh, uh, um, the, the Senate seat in the uh, capital of Islamabad. And that was because mainly because its own parliamentarians from its own party defected to the opposition. They were literally offered millions of rupees and they sold their votes to the opposition. And this is the thing which has always plagued Pakistan, this democratic system, which is based on, on secularism. The idea that you can divide life's affairs from your uh, personal affairs. This is the basis of this system in Pakistan, and these elites have used that to capture 
power button. They've never given that up. And this is why we see these uh, policies being Im implemented, you know, the taking of loans from the IMF, um, the abandoning of Kashmir to India, uh, helping to helping the Americans to occupy Afghanistan. All of these things actually serve the ruling elites in uh, Pakistan today because it helps to maintain the status quo. It allows them to continue in power, to, to continue making money, whereas the rest of the people, they're impoverished. They have nothing but poverty and insecurity, um, you know, as, 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 as what they've been given by these rulers of Pakistan. Uh, we've got a hand up from Brother Wahid, so I'll, I'll let him ask his question, inshallah. Exactly. Um, Salam, guys. Um, I've just got I've just got a question, Brother Hamza. Uh, you kind of briefly touched this earlier with regards to the military and uh, nuclear power of Pakistan. So um, it's like a two part question, basically. So the first part is how well of a uh, potential candidate in where in where commas here would it be to establish a Khalafa state? And um, obviously, if that is not the case, how would it be able to help the Khilafa empire kind of expand within that region? Because obviously, as I'm sure you're more aware, that it does have a lot of military power as well as nuclear power. So it does have a kind of stronghold within the region anyway. But then also touching upon that, it's got its ties with China as well. So I just want to see what your thoughts would be on that. Exactly. Oh, okay, exactly. Abdullah, would you like me to answer that? <clears throat> Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Pakistan is a very suitable candidate for the Khilafah to re-emerge. Um, as I mentioned before, it has a strong military, it has nuclear weapons, um, and you can see, the, you know, people question that, well, you've got a million plus soldiers on the um, eastern border of Pakistan with India, and yet Pakistan, despite being a smaller country of 200 million people, and the Indians being more than a billion, having more than a million troops, and despite being a nuclear state themselves, Pakistan has held India at bay. So Pakistan is more than capable of taking care of itself and doing a lot more than that. What's actually missing is the political leadership and the will to do anything more, for example, for, uh, for the people of Kashmir. Secondly, as I mentioned, Pakistan has a lot of resources. You know, out of the 200 million people in uh, Pakistan today, nearly one third are under the age of 35, and that proportion is increasing. So Pakistan has a very youthful, abundant population. Whereas when we look at countries like Japan, Germany, an increasing problem with demographics with an aging population, that's not the case with Pakistan. It has a youthful population. Many of its talented people actually come abroad to countries like the UK to seek work and employment. But they have a lot of talent that's just simply not being utilized in a country like Pakistan. Pakistan also has a large agricultural base. You know, when you, when, you, when you think of the poverty that surrounds the people in Pakistan, yet it is amazing that that land is sustaining more than 200 million people. That's simply because the country has a large amount of agricultural resources. The only problem is that those resources are not being divided fairly in that country, and, that, and the full potential of the agricultural land in Pakistan is not being fully developed and you being used. So, when the Khilafah, you know, the Khilafah has a certain vision, it has certain ideas upon which policies would be built um, in, 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 in terms of agricultural land reforms, in terms of uh, taxation, in terms of the gold silver standard for currency, in terms of privatizing uh, public uh, resources. You know, these, these ideas are fundamentally different from the capitalist policies that we see in countries like Pakistan uh, being applied today and, the, and much of the rest of the world. Uh, including the UK. So the point I'm trying to stress here is that you have the resources in a country like Pakistan. What's actually missing is the political leadership, uh, the ideas, the ideology upon which to base your solutions um, and the political leadership which will bring these to life. If we have those ingredients, then Pakistan is the perfect place for the Khilafah to emerge and for it to spread to the rest of the Muslim world, inshallah, in due course. Um, question from the chat. I speak to people, this is a question, I speak to people from Pakistan who are so angry with the broken promises in the last election. What shall I say to them when they say that we want Islam, but are never given more than a slogan, even from so-called Islamic parties? Sorry, could you repeat that question? I seem, I seem to have lost that. Sure, I'm sorry. So the question is saying basically that what should they say to the people of Pakistan who are angry with the prom broken promises from the last election? Um, 
you know, many people will say they want Islam, but they never hear more anything more than just slogans, even from the parties that claim to be Islamic. I think that's a very good question, and uh, and you know, whoever you know, whoever that person who asked that question, and many people actually make this point as well. They certainly feel cheated and let down by the rulers of Pakistan today, and unfortunately, Imran Khan is no different from uh, Asif Ali Dardari and Nas Nawaz Sharif who came be, uh, came before him. There's a long line list of rulers who've actually made empty promises and and frankly betrayed the people of Pakistan. I think the question is this, you see, what we see in Pakistan today is actually a, a charade. You know, it's actually, uh, you know, it's actually a cruel joke which is played on the people of Pakistan. What you actually see are a change of faces taking place. So you have Asif Ali Zardari, then you have an election, then Nawaz Sharif comes along, then you have an election, then Imran Khan comes along. And undoubtedly, in two years' time, you're going to have another election in Pakistan and somebody else will come along. However, the fundamental system which is used to rule Pakistan, the secular democratic system, remains in place. And the same players, the same politicians, they remain in power using the system. So many of the MPAs, you know, many of the parliamentarians who are now part of Imran Khan's party, they were previously part of uh, the People's Party, which is Asif Ali Zardari's party, which has now been inherited by Bilawal Bhutto, or they were part of Nawaz Sharif's party, which is now being inherited by Maryam Nawaz, his daughter. So effectively, what you got, you know, you, you have these musical chairs being played in Pakistan, where you see these same people, they move around from one party to another. The ruling face may change, the ruler may change. You see that change, but fundamentally, these people still remain in power. And more importantly, these policies that the policies that they're applying they also remain the same. So, for example, taking loans from the IMF. Imran Khan has done that. Nawaz Sharif did that. Asif Ali Zardari did that. Pervez Musharraf did that. It remains the same. Keeping the status quo with India over Kashmir, saying no more than, you know, paying lip service effectively, just uttering mere words. Again, Imran Khan is doing exactly the same which the previous rulers did. Collaborating with America to occupy Afghanistan, providing supply lines through Pakistan. Again, Imran Khan has continued to allow that, just as Nawaz Sharif, Asif Ali Zardari, Pervez Musharraf did the same as well. So, what I'm actually trying to say here is that you need, and you know, before I actually before I finish, I'd also like to add in terms of economic policies, in terms of privatizing uh, key resources like the generation of electricity, our uh, Again, these policies, this policy has remained the same, no matter what the ruler has been. So what I'm actually trying to say here is that this system it has is only following a certain, you know, for, is only following a certain set of policies. And no matter the face may change, these policies remain the same. So fundamentally, the problem is not necessarily just the, the ruler in power. It's actually the system in place, which is the real problem, which actually enables these people to come to power and allows them to carry on applying these policies, many of which fly in the face of Islam. I'm going to combine the next two questions because they're basically asking the same thing. So generally, how aware would you say Pakistan is of the need for a Khilafah system being a solution or responsibility for their problems? How would you estimate the awareness is? Sorry, I seem to have lost you there again. No, no, I was, just, I was just saying, like, how, how would you, in your, in your opinion, um, what, what kind of awareness would you say that there is in Pakistan society of this, of these things? Of the problem itself or the solution? Uh, of the solution, of the need for a Khilafah system as a solution. Well, I think it's, at times it's difficult to get, but, you know, there have been polls in the past, you know, for example, like the University of Maryland, they ask the question very specifically. They say, would you like to see the application of Sharia law in Pakistan? And well over 83% of respondents actually said, yes, they would like to see the Sharia being applied in Pakistan. So, you know, and the other polls as well, which indicate very strong support as well. Um, you know, it may be called by different names. We call it Khilafah. Uh, many people in Pakistan may call it nizam -e mustafa But many people have a very strong uh, emotional attachment with Islam, and they see these current rulers failing. They see the system as being completely corrupt. They can see that it's done nothing for the people. So, a lot of people, a lot of feel, people feel the problem, and increasingly, they see they disregard these rulers. They disregard the democratic system. Uh, 
And many people, you know, they have this understanding of the Sharia, they have the understanding of the Quran, the Sunnah, the method of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What they really need uh, is somebody to enable and, 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 you know, bring about the system in Pakistan today. And just to sort of uh, pick up on one thing you said very, very quickly, we say people are losing faith in their leaders and so on. Uh, Imran Khan kind of stood on this idea of Naya Pakistan, of New Pakistan, and you know, maybe around the time he was elected on this kind of wave of hope that maybe he'd be different. What is the general opinion of people in Pakistan about Imran Khan at the moment? Well, you know, Imran Khan, you know, uh, represented hope for many people, particularly people from the cities, people, you know, people from Lahore, Karachi, Islamabad, Peshawar, they placed a lot of uh, faith and currency in Imran Khan. And, you know, to the point that, you know, I remember very clearly that, you know, before 2018, when you would debate and discuss, uh, you know, the situation in Pakistan, they simply wouldn't listen to you, many of them. They, they had this almost blind emotion attachment to Imran Khan, simply because of the man himself, personality. But since that time, what's actually happened is that the hard realities of ruling have now kicked in. So Imran Khan, for example, he's a man before coming to power, he denounced the IMF. But then after a few months in power, six, seven, eight, nine months in power, he turned to the IMF. And not only did he turn to the IMF, he actually implemented the harsh measures which the IMF demanded that be applied in Pakistan. So, for example, devaluing the rupee, uh, removing some of the subsidies that were given for electricity, increasing the price of electricity, increasing the price of gas. And I'm not just talking about once or twice here. You know, the price of electricity and gas is, in Pakistan since Imran Khan has come to power has increased multiple fold, five or six times, five or six separate different occasions. And obviously, when you see the increase, uh, when you see the rupee being devalued, uh, much of the petrol, the diesel, which is imported from outside, that feeds in as your basic cost to any business electricity, gas, petrol, diesel, these feed into your basic costs for any business. As any, anyone who runs a business will understand that. So naturally, prices are going to rise. We are seeing double-digit inflation in Pakistan, and that was before COVID. COVID has only happened last year. We, I'm talking about before COVID, this is all started happening. So the man has definitely lost all credibility in the eyes of the people. And the people who are perhaps the most disillusioned with him are his former supporters. They can see that this man has done nothing. He has uttered nothing but you know empty promises. And this is why Imran Khan has uh, you know he's acquired the nickname of U-Turn Khan because the man has completely done the opposite of what he actually said, and the man has actually destroyed his own credibility. Um, we've got a hand raised from Brother Rizwan. So, brother, if you'd like to go ahead, inshallah, with your question. Assalamualaikum. Um, I think um, I, I was there at the election uh, when Imran Khan got elected and um, it's been uh, it's, uh, and when I came back over here and the daily the aftermath for from my relatives and seeing them slowly day by day crushed the I mean, I mean uh, it was it, it's, it's just been I mean the nightmare is, is a very small word word for what I've seen my family go through in Pakistan. Um, and we're not people who don't have means. Uh, we are people outside of the country and price rises, grinding poverty. Um, and that's, I mean, bear in mind, we have people who are out all over the world from our family and we've, we, we, we were just absolutely embarrassed uh, by the situation that we we we, we see day to day, I mean, uh, my 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 nieces, my nephews, uh, who are all university age, they're in uh, in such deep deep trouble. Um, even basic necessities in in Islamabad, this is, you don't get them. Electricity, water. I mean, these things don't happen. And the thing is, is is that when I was there, when the election happened, a lot of the a lot of my my relatives who were uh, voting for PTI, saying, look, things are going to change, things are going to get better. And I was having that conversation, well, I hope they do, but they're not going to. And having those uh, conversations now, and just keeping that relationship go going was really, really important. And the times in the last couple of years when I had the same conversation, I'm seeing them crying on the phone when things are going wrong and they can't get basic things done. It means that our efforts are really have to be stepped up, subhanAllah. So this is not just a uh, something which it affects people who we know, who we love, 
Uh, I just want to make that point because sometimes we 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 have to have, we are one ummah, and it doesn't matter the, our, our brothers and sisters in in Pakistan. They, I mean, some have sincerely voted for PTI for PTI in the last election. Things we were going to change, and they're they're now coming unstuck. So then you see a solution, and we need to present that solution to them, inshallah. Unfortunately, it's very sad that we, we hear these stories, but these stories are, are not uncommon, unfortunately. This is the harsh reality that many Pakistanis find themselves in. Imran Khan has become a, a spectacular failure to the extent that we now see his own MNAs and MPAs dumping ship to the opposition, the Pakistan Democratic Movement, which is composed of the People's Party, Nawaz Sharif's party, the Noon League, and Jamaat Ulma Islam, which is led by Maulana Khazraman. This is why they're abandoning ship. This is why they are banning the ship of Imran Khan. And as we speak, Imran Khan is due to take a vote of confidence from the National Assembly tomorrow um, at 12 o'clock uh, midday um, to see if he has the support of his own parliamentarians, because these people are very pragmatic. They can see that Imran Khan is on a sinking ship. He's not going anywhere and he's losing support. He's losing public support badly, which is why they're now looking at other options. And the truth is that Imran Khan himself you know, he, Imran Khan himself is not actually the real problem. We, we have to talk to our friends and family back in Pakistan and around the world. Unfortunately, people who are living abroad perhaps don't feel the problems that the people in Pakistan experience. There's almost like a time lag of many months before they perhaps uh, uh, become accustomed to or understand what's actually going on. But we need to draw the attention to the fact that, look, you have to look at the system being applied and compare that with the Islamic system. Look, Islam brought peace and prosperity to much of the Muslim world for over 1,300 years. There's no precedence of a democratic system in Islam before the colonial era. There is no example of, of a dem democratic system where man, where the ruler sits down and he makes up the laws for himself. It never happened. And one of the things when we look at the beauty of Islam, Islam places a great emphasis on the redistribution of wealth fairly equitably amongst the people in society and also fulfilling their basic needs. So when we actually hear this nara from, uh, from the mouth of Bilawal Bhutto and then from his mother and then from his grandfather, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto of Roti Kapra Makan, this nara wasn't actually uh, created by Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. This was actually told to us by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a beautiful hadith that every man, woman, and child has a right to uh, you know, uh, clothes, shelter, and food. These are the basic rights which have to be fulfilled by the ruler, by the Khalifa, under the Khilafah. And when you have that ideological principle established that these things must be provided to the people, there is no exception to this. That is a you know, huge difference of day and night between the Islamic system and the capitalist system, which we see in Pakistan, which has no regard, no care for the people, and which is why we hear these sad stories of people suffering in Pakistan today. Um, so question in the group kind of linked a little bit to what you're saying. What can we learn from Imran Khan's recent trip to Sri Lanka, specifically in regards to the false cremations? Uh, and just before I pass it on to you, Brother Atif, I'd like to say that there is actually a video uh, on this on the West London Dawa YouTube channel, uh, which I think will be in the chat, inshallah. So do go check that out. But uh, over to you, Brother Atif, please, for that question. Sorry, I, I lost the first part of the question, if you could please repeat sure. that. So, so what can we learn from Imran Khan's recent trip to Sri Lanka, specifically in regards to the issue of false cremation? Well, look, it's a good thing that the Sri Lankan government has decided to stop cremating the remains of Muslims. Um, you know, but I don't think that is an achievement uh, uh, simply uh, that we can attribute to Imran Khan. There was political pressure building up amongst the Muslims of Sri Lanka, and there was an outcry from them, and there was a, as there was an outcry from many Muslims around the world. So this was actually the culmination of that. But look, that is really a drop in the ocean when we consider the problems that the people of Pakistan face. Indeed, many uh, you know Muslims face around the world. We can't just simply say, well, yes, if that happened, now uh, Imran Khan is a success. Clearly, for the people of Pakistan, Imran Khan is a absolute failure. So we need to put that aside. We need to look at the problems which confront the people of Pakistan. We need to look at our deen. We need to look at Islam. What, you know, what does, you know, our deen is not just simply about fasting, about praying as salah, going on hajj and paying as zakat. That's not the case. They are fundamentals of our deen and they are part of our deen. 
Adin remains incomplete until we establish this estate. So, for example, when we talk about the Hadud punishment, the Aziyat, you know, when we talk about the cutting of the hand of the thief, that's not down to me and you to go and cut the hand of the thief if we see a thief in society. The Islamic State has to take responsibility for that. So all of these laws, all of these Sharia rules, they're currently being held in abeyance at the moment. Who's going to implement these? Who's going to collect the zakat? Zakat is not supposed to be collected by charity. This is supposed to be collected by the battle mal of the state. Who's going to collect that? Who's going to distribute that? Who's going to take responsibility for the machine or for the poor or the weak and the vulnerable in society? We don't expect charities to take care of these things in, in, in Western countries like the UK. So why do we see this as an acceptable solution for a country like Pakistan? This is absolutely ridiculous and this is actually fundamentally wrong. What needs to happen here is that we need to re-establish the state which will take responsibility for taking care of the affairs of the people in an equitable, just manner. And we see the misery, not just in the Muslim world, but the rest of the world today. We see these capitalist policies failing the people of the West as well. Who's going to provide that alternative? Well, let me tell you, it was the Muslims in the, eras, in the era gone by who provided that alternative to the rest of the world. And inshallah, when the Khilafah is provided, it will again provide that ideological alternative to the rest of the world. And it will remove these corrupt rulers in these other lands who actually you know, oppress their people. When we actually look at and fundamentally look at these situations, the political situation and realities in countries around the world, we see one thing which is in common amongst all of them. And that is the economic oppression that we see them implementing on many of their people. Many of these people are taxed heavily. Many of them are deprived of a basic income so that they're deprived of these basic goods and services. This is where the Khilafah will actually establish real justice on, 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 in our world. And it can only be done through the state. And it will actually bring Islam to the rest of the world using many tools at its disposal, including diplomacy, including jihad, to remove these corrupt tyrant rulers in these other lands and it will spread and ensure and take care of people as it did before. Uh, hand up from Brother Ammar, so I'll go to him for his question. Brother Ammar, are you there? Yes, I'm sorry, I just couldn't unmute. Um, well, brother, for the answer so far, they've been really, really clear, Alhamdulillah. Um, one, one thing a lot of Muslims say, though, is that uh, Khilafah is a dream because of the disunity in the Muslim world today, whereas you've got Sunni and Shia, and then within Sunnis, you've got lots of different opinions and, 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 and so much division. So how would you respond to that? Well, look, difference of opinion is an acceptable uh, idea in Islam. And, you know, this is actually nothing new. You know, we, yes, there we have, uh, you know, Imam Jafri and his school, which uh, Shias follow. And we have the four other main classical scholars, as we know, in Sunni Islam. Uh, you know, having a difference of opinion is not a problem. And, you know, so that's from, a, th from, a, from a, a Sulli point of view. But from a political point of view, this has not been a problem in the past. I mean, you look at our history over 1300 years. Yes, we were the Shia absent, for example. They existed. They were there. And yet that did not prevent the Khilafah from being established and implementing its rules that needed to be implemented. And the sad fact is that, you know, this supposed division between Sunni and Shia is actually played up and exploited by foreign powers, you know, whose interest it serves to actually play up these differences. You know, this is actually a very dirty game that is played. And, you know, we have to remember that the differences always exist. They don't just exist in the Muslim world but they also exist within the West. For example, in the UK, you have Catholics and Protestants. Does that now mean that the union will fall apart in, in the UK? This is not the case. We've seen the troubles in Northern Ireland, for example, yet they've been able to come to an accommodation of, of, of sorts. So that, that is certainly not the case. And these are differences which are actually even played up by our own rulers because they use that to try to discredit the Islamic ruling system. I would say to people that if you can put up with people like Asif Ali Zardari and the likes of Nawaz Shif and now, with this, uh, you know, frankly, this, uh, you know, uh, charlatan like Imran Khan, who clearly has demonstrated he has no grasp of his political affairs in his country, then why can you not accept the rule of Islam, which has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Um, I want to jump back to something you were talking about a little while ago, or something that was raised in an answer to one question. Um, Obviously, we're talking about Islam as a solution and what people in Pakistan 
consider in terms of Islam as a solution. I wonder how many people look to China, for example, as a solution to their problems, or how many people still look to the Western countries for their solutions? How, how much of a, a grasp do these powers have over the people of Pakistan? Well, these are really, you know, this, they don't have any political grasp as such. It's really a cultural uh, domination. And yes, this is true that in, uh, in Pakistan, a lot of the people particularly the ruling elites, many of whom go abroad for their education, their children then follow them as well. They've been mesmerized by Western solutions. But, you know, as I said before, something else which I said earlier as well, it suits the elites to apply these systems. You know, it suits the elite to have the democratic system. You know, many of the people who participate in the democratic system, not just in Pakistan, but right around the world, even in America, you know, these people they have to spend lots of money in order to enable themselves to come forth. And that's no different in Pakistan. Many million of rupees are spent on getting a ticket uh, to become a member of the National Assembly or a member of the provincial assemblies. And these guys don't come in there for the love of the people. They see this as a business. They spend a certain amount of money and they want four or five time return when they come into power, when they become ministers, when they through, whether it's through corruption, whether it's taking kickbacks through contracts. This is how they view the democratic system. It's just a means of making money for, for, for these people and retaining influence. So, yes, uh, people have been affected by, you know, supposed uh, Western, uh, you know, the solutions. And the West has made great strides in many affairs. But at the same time, the West has also great problems as well. And we would know that better than many people. By living here, as we see the many societal problems. And we also now are seeing great poverty in these countries as well. Remember, you know, part of the reason why the West surged ahead and developed this great prosperity it wasn't just because of its economic system or because of its uh, um, scientific research and the industry which it developed. A large part of this wealth was down to the fact that they were looting countries like India through their uh, colonial projects. You know, I mean, Shashi Kapoor, you know, he, he's written a book where he actually talks about how Britain alone took hundreds of billions out of India uh, across the 200 years that it ruled India. India at one point was contributing more than 25% of world GDP. Now that's down to a mere 3.6% or something thereabouts. That was largely because, and that, that GDP, which figure which I quote for India, it wasn't under the modern uh, Hindu rule in, in India today. That was under the Mughal rule, under the Muslim rule, under Muslim economic rules which were applied. So the key thing is that we need to, you know, we need to talk to our friends and family. We need to tell them that, look, this is not a land of milk and honey that you see uh, from afar off, where you see in countries like Britain, there's real poverty, there's real problems here, there's a real societal breakdown, family breakdown. If you want to adopt Western solutions, then you're also going to get the Western problems as part of the package. We need to look at our history, our deen, our Islam. Islam provides a faith for us in every sphere of life. Allah Ta'ala is not going to, if, he's, if we accept the fact that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has created us, then we also need to accept the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to leave us alone. He's going to provide the guide for us. And that guide for us is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has provided the complete blueprint of how we need to run our lives, both personally and at a state level, at a political level. And what is actually required now is the political will to re-establish the state. Uh, question in the chat. What is the hukum on voting in Pakistan? The hukum is quite clear. You cannot take part in a in a kufr system because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he talks about in Surah Al-Imran that he who rules by Allah than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, they are the uh, oppressors, they are the fasikun, and they are even the kafirun. This is in Surah Al-Maidah, these three uh, ayahs. So clearly when you have a system where you're actually putting on par with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, man, so when we talk about shirk, Shirk actually means associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how can you actually, when Allah ta'ala has said that sovereignty should belong to him, how can you have man deciding what is halal and what is haram? This is what in effect happens in parliament. You know, many people get confused. They think that you're against voting. We're not against voting. As a Muslim, I'm not against the principle of voting. I'm not against the principle of having equitable representation where we have representation for for the people what i'm actually against is the fact that once you've actually voted what actually happens across the next four or five years what actually happens across the next four or five years in the democratic system is that you have politicians like imran khan uh, Bilal Bhutto, Bariam Nawaz, they sit in parliament 
they decide amongst themselves what rules they want to apply, what legislation they want to pass. And this is the haram aspect. This is where you're now actually putting yourself on par, equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is actually haram and forbidden. This is not allowed. Um, I just want to see if there's any more questions from the audience. Uh, does anyone have a hand up? I uh, can't see any hand up. There's nothing else in the chat as far as I can see. So I want to start drawing this to a close. Um, but I'd like to ask, I guess, one final question just to sort of summarize everything we've talked about. Um, you know, the, the premise we were talking about here is the fact that Muslims who live in the Western countries can sometimes not have, uh, when we talk about Khilafah, it can sometimes seem like a pipe dream because it's hard to, when you live in the West and your whole uh, upbringing and your society is all built on Kufr, it's very hard to see how, how Islam works as a, as a system. I guess my question to you is, and obviously we know that victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when you look at Pakistan, do you see a place that you are able to picture uh, a Khilafah existing in? Absolutely. Uh, Pakistan is the, you know, one of the ideal places for a Khilafah to emerge. Like, I, as I said previously before, Pakistan has been endowed with many great resources, huge potential. It just hasn't been used or managed in the right way. And when you look at, the, and moreover, when you look at the political situation in Pakistan today, Pakistan is politically unstable. You just have to look at the, you know, a lot of hope, a lot of capital was placed in Imran Khan as being the savior, the messiah for Pakistan. And, you know, Imran Khan didn't just come to power by himself. He was backed by what is known as the establishment in Pakistan. And that is the military, um, uh, you know, other important people like civil society, influentials, businessmen, industrialists, uh, uh, judges, what have you. All of these influentials, the power brokers in, in Pakistani society. But yet, Imran Khan, within two years, two and a half years, has been exposed for what he is. And he is nothing more than a paper tiger. Imran Khan has nothing to offer the people of Pakistan. So the people can clearly see that. And the country is in, you know, is always enduring bouts of political turmoil. But what we're actually now seeing is the discreditation of the Imran Khan project. It's falling apart. So that you, as a Pakistani, you know, you, we have to ask the average Pakistani, what do you now see as the way forward for your country? What do you see as the way forward for Pakistan? And many will actually be at a loss. Many are disillusioned. They, there is nothing else to, uh, to, to inspire them. And we actually have the alternative. It's from our deen, it's from Islam. We simply have to increase the activity that we are doing at the moment to talk to people, to talk to our friends and family, not just here, but in Pakistan. Yes, we are distant from Pakistan. We're 4,000 miles away. Perhaps it may, we may not experience or feel or sense, you know, uh, this the, uh, you know, the political situation, just as we don't perhaps experience the economic problems that, uh, that are existent in Pakistan. But these problems are there. They're real. Talk to your uh, talk to anybody you know in Pakistan, and they will largely, um, um, you know, abet and um, validate what I'm saying here. So it's not about what we think here in this country. Khilafa is not going to be established in the UK. We're talking about establishing Khilafa in Pakistan, and the people of Pakistan are being crushed by the economic poverty which is being implemented by this corrupt democratic system in Pakistan, where these politicians have failed. So we really need to come together and really push and demand and talk to our friends and family, talk to the influentials in society, you know, those that we may, may know through our friends and family. And we need to say to them, it's not just about material gain. We need to say to them, this is what your deen says. This is part of your deen. Nobody, we are not going to be, you know, we're not going to exist in this world forever. Our life is relatively short. We're here today, tomorrow, we're definitely going to leave. How are you going to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Especially when I'm telling you that this is from Islam. We need to challenge people. We need to challenge the concept, the ideas that they hold. And we need to make them think that, you know, that these people need to do their duty and they need to reestablish the khilaf and that they actually brings the peace and justice and stability, not just to the lands of Pakistan, but inshallah to the rest of the Muslim world and in due course to the rest of the world as well. Just off the back of that, there's a quick question in the chat. Um, where does Pakistan compare to other potential Islamic countries that may uh, one day be the, uh, under the Khilafah? 
Well, I think Pakistan's right up there, right at the top. Maybe, you know, it's uh, Turkey and Pakistan, you know, these are the two front runners to establish Khilafah. You know, you have other Mughal lands like Egypt as well. Yes, they're candidates as well. But, you know, Turkey, you know, Alhamdulillah, they have the legacy, they have the history of the uh, Uthmani Khilafah. You know, they have a strong military. And then, of course, you've got Pakistan, you know, Muslims very passionate about Islam. We've got the strong military there abundant resources, 200 million plus people, huge countries strategically located. It's right up there, let me tell you. Jazakallah khair. Um, so I think with that, inshallah, if we haven't got any further questions, I'll start bringing it to a close. Uh, brothers, just to remind you uh, of what we said at the beginning. So this Sunday, inshallah, there'll be a special show on a century of struggle uh, hosted on al Waqiyah TV by members of Hizb al-Tahrir Britain with uh, an exceptional panel in Sheikh Hassan Rashid, Muslim Beg, and Dili Hussein. Please do attend that. And then the second reminder is for the global conference that is the culmination of this Rajab theme. And that will be on the 13th of March, Saturday the 13th of March, 5 p.m. UK time. And there'll be it will be across a variety of languages. So just two events to keep in mind related to this theme that we've been running for the last few weeks. I'd like to say Jazakallah Khair to Brother Atif for giving us his time today and, and answering your questions. And I'd like, I'd like him just to finish, inshallah, with a quick recitation of Surah Asr. Wal as, inna l-insan ala fi khus, illa l-lazina amanu wa amilu salihat, wa tawasaw bil haqqe wa tawasaw bil sab. Amin. Jazakallah Khair, and inshallah we'll see you next week on the next show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as-salam.